Hey everyone, and welcome to this Dota 2 guide on how to play Beastmaster, a prototypical position 3 offlaner with tremendous teamfight and stunning capabilities. He is a hero that has tremendous utility in all stages of the game, with his aura providing incredible teamfight and push potential, and his ultimate primal roar being one of the longest effective, reliable stuns in the game that pierces BKB. He's a hero that is often stayed away from by new players because of the requirement to micromanage his, uh, micromanage his beasts. But ultimately, once you move past that, you'll find that Beastmaster is an absolutely incredible hero with a ton of utility and is a lot of fun to play. This guide is going to focus in a couple different stages. The first, I'm going to talk to you about the skills and talent builds that are currently relevant in the meta. That being said, the link to this guide that you can add in the uh, Dota 2 client is in the description down below. And I will update it depending on how the meta shifts. So if anything changes, the guide will remain up to date. Then I'll discuss the item builds, and then I'll show you some skill examples of how to utilize his skills in the game. And then I'll finalize the video with some replay examples as well. Um, now, let's talk about his skills and talents. The first thing you need to understand about Beastmaster is there's a couple different approaches to building him. Some people tend to try and build towards Wild Axes first, but realistically in the current meta, the best uh, choice is to build towards your uh, Call of the Wild Boar. Your Wild Boars will allow you to last hit very effectively, block enemy camps and also allow you to harass supports and carries to good effectiveness they also scale very well in the early game and really poorly in the late game which is something that's important to consider you also gain the ability to scout appropriately although it is very mana intensive it might be something you want to uh, do a little more sparingly in the very early laning stage but later in the game call the wild hawk is one of the best abilities in the entire game from there, you're building Inner Beast. Now, something you need to keep in mind with Inner Beast is that Inner Beast will always push your lane. Because of the attack speed benefit being applied to your lane creeps, you'll always be, apl be applying lane pressure towards the enemy tower. So being able to keep le uh, the lane equilibrium towards your tower is a little more difficult for your support. It's something to consider. You're always going to be pushing as a Beastmaster. With that being said, at level 6, you gain an incredible power spike. You gain a BKB piercing uh, primal war ability that does a tremendous amount of damage, stuns the enemy, and increases your speed and all your uh, minion speed by 30 uh, by 40 percent. Sorry, the reason why this is important is because it can be used to close down on top of an enemy, but more importantly, it can be used to kind of keep an enemy locked in place so that you can solidify a kill. Now, the important thing about Primal Roar is that its timing is, oft is often coincided with the, uh, the completion of your Helm of the Dominator. That means that you will have three creeps and yourself on top of an enemy hero in addition to the damage being applied and the stun of Primal Roar. As a Beastmaster, once you hit level 6 and 7, you have Primal Roar and you complete your Helm of the Dominator, you're basically killing the enemy carry on the cadence of the cooldown. Every 100 seconds, every 80 seconds, every 60 seconds, you are getting a kill because you're combining Primal Roar with the potential uh, power of Helm of the Dominator. He's a tremendous laner and incredibly talented um, kind of like multitasker because you can move the minions into different parts of the map and do a lot of work for you, push side lanes, um, and uh, he's just tremendous. And with that being said, the talent build right now revolves around amplifying your ability to sustain the lane sustain your pressure and right now the way it works is you're currently building towards mana regeneration now if you get a good start and you find yourself really in in the mix of the fights and you're being more more of a tank and more of a scrappy scrappy hero you can take the damage and it really amplifies his right click ability because with wild axes you do amplify his damage as it does it does it amplify the damage of all his minions as well the result of that is if you get on top of somebody with wild axes and you have the additional damage talents you can kill them much faster but you'll often find yourself really strapped for mana and that's why you often build a ring of basilius early on but we'll talk about that shortly from there you're taking the movement speed the only change in this build is that you take the wild axes if you're building the arcane boots into agonum scepter aether lens build that's something totally different that i'll talk about shortly but that's the only time you take that talent you otherwise you're taking the movement speed you're taking the boar damage generally speaking if you want to be tankier you do take the health talent um the reason why 
there's some confusion with this is that it says 250 health for Beastmaster controlled units. That actually includes Beastmaster himself. So he gets a 250 health increase as do all the units he controls. And finally, you can take the uh, Primal Roar cooldown if you wish, if, you, if you're acting like a Blink Initiator. But generally speaking, in most lineups, especially at lower MMRs where there's a lot of right-click centric carries, the 30 inner uh, Beast attack speed is going to be really beneficial because it simply makes your team, like, it punishes enemies so bad when you when you get a couple kills and you're pushing towers and your team is just attacking with 45 75 increased attack speed it is truly remarkable how much damage can be output with the inner beast talents okay those are the talent builds and skill builds and again i'll keep these up to date depending on the meta and how it shifts so you know be sure to subscribe to the guide with that being said items Let's talk about items. So with regards to items, you are starting with, uh, you know, Tangle Quelling Blade. The reason for this is because you want to have some uh, some regeneration. You're not rushing a ring of health uh, with a Beastmaster. The Quelling Blade allows you to last hit better. And you're taking some stats. Iron Branches into Gauntlets of Strength. The advantage for Strength Heroes as an offlaner is that you can pick up Gauntlets of Strength as value items. Not only do they increase your HP, but they increase your last hitting potential as well, which is great. You can also build it into a Soul Ring later on if you so choose. The realistic truth is that you're building towards a Helm of the Dominator. The item, the core item here is the Helm of the Iron Will. It provides you with armor and with health regeneration. Once you get that item, you become nearly impossible to lane against. You are getting that item first, and then you're building the rest to complete the Helm of the Dominator. The Helm of the Dominator should complete at roughly the same time as Primal Roar coming online, maybe a maybe 30 minute, 30 seconds to a you know a minute later. And then ultimately, once you have both Primal Roar and Helm of the Dominator, you're taking a creep. And and you're getting a kill okay very important and i will be discussing individual creeps momentarily um ring of basilius is going to help you uh kind of keep your mana regeneration in check it also builds into your um your vladimir's offering which is part of the helm of the overlord and you need brown boots you typically stay at brown boots but you know that's something you can uh, kind of play with if you really want to be kind of a tanky menace you can't even go uh you know uh, phase boots which is really popular you get added damage you get the added armor you get that phase movement speed so that you can move through your summoned units and it makes things a little easier helm of the overlord represents a very significant power spike for the Beastmaster. once you get helm of the overlord you can take over an ancient creep uh you are getting the benefit of vladimir's offerings uh kind of um aura you become an aura monster helm of the overlord creates an aura you have the inner beast aura and you become just a very very powerful mid-game hero that can pretty much do anything on the map that becomes amplified with drums of endurance the drums of endurance are great because once you have all your your minions you have your boars you have your uh you have your ancient creep your your dragon whatever it might be you can now push into enemy uh, territory, use Inner Beast in conjunction with the Drums of Endurance, because they do stack, and then you can basically just melt down towers. It is truly remarkable. From there, you're going Agnum Shard. This allows your Call of the Wild Hawk to become selectable, and what that allows you to do is allows you to stun enemies by selecting the, uh, the Call of the Wild Hawk. It also reduces its cooldown, so it can be on the field more often. And finally... Once again, stacking with both Inner Beast and the Drums of Endurance, you have Assault Curus, which becomes basically just an attack speed. You know, it, it just allows you to basically end the game because not only are you basically uh, reducing armor from all your nearby enemies and structures, you're increasing armor for your allied units and structures and the attack speed. So you're, all your minions, all your allies with Inner Beast, Drums, and uh, the Assault Curus are just going to basically melt down the opposition. From there, there are some niche items that you can consider. First of all, Blink Dagger is a very important consideration on Beastmaster. When used with Prime Reward, you can, you can become a Blink Initiator. So let's say you're against the Sniper, for instance. The Sniper, as a Beastmaster, you don't want to just run up to him and just get, get shot down, right? You need to initiate on top of the Sniper, on top of the Drow Ranger. So what you do is you Blink in, you Prime Reward, and then you take him out before he's able to react. That is where you use something like a Blink Dagger, where you need to initiate on top of the enemy. Phase boots, we already talked about. Uh, Pipe of Insight, if you're against a magic-centric lineup uh, and your team really needs that magic defense, you can consider building it, although generally speaking, this item build is still higher win rate. 
From there, you can also consider something like a Heaven's Halberd. It gives him a tremendous amount of survivability, gives him a lot of status resistance, uh, status resistance and most importantly, the active disarm will allow you to basically prevent right-clicking carries from doing their thing for three seconds, which can be very significant. And most importantly, five seconds on range targets, which is extremely significant against snipers and drow rangers and other things that make life very hard for a melee hero like Beastmaster. From there, Lotus Orb is always a consideration for uh, position threes. Although he doesn't need the dispel as much as others, in some games it is still particularly valuable. BKB if you need to survive longer in fights. Solar Crest, a bit of a niche one, but still, if you really want to amplify the ability of a right-clicking carry, it is something that is inexpensive. If you fall behind a little bit in your game and uh, you know you don't have a good laning stage and you want to help your team, it is a good option as well. Although I still think that this build is generally better. Now. Everything comes down to these these three items here. It's a really fun build. It's a totally different setup. But basically what you do is you actually do not build this, this get up here. You build Arcane Boots into Aghanim Scepter into Aether Lens. You focus in on leveling Wild Axes. And with the Aghanim Scepter, your, uh, your Wild Axes become cooldown free. And you can just keep throwing them and throwing them and throwing them. And as you can see, the damage amplification stacks every time, as does you have a talent that improves it as well with your mana regeneration. You basically become this ranged spellcaster that's a complete nightmare to deal with. It's a very fun build and very unique. Now, what we're going to do at this point in time is we are going to talk about um, the utilization of his skills in-game. All right, everyone, in this quick example, I'm going to show you how to utilize some of his abilities in game. Now, the first thing to understand about Wild Axes is that Wild Axes does damage for each axe that hits the enemy. That means that the axes actually go from his left hand to his right hand and his right hand to his left hand. So if an enemy gets hit by both axes, he takes double the damage. Also, if an enemy gets hit at the apex, which is like where the axes meet, they take double damage as well. It's also important to understand that the axes amplify damage done by Beastmaster and all of his minions. It's also important to know that the axes provide the damage amplification before it applies the damage. That means that on first impact, they actually amplify their own damage outright. So that's important to understand as well. And as you can see here, you can hit multiple enemies from one set of axes, okay? Again, they travel from left to right and right to left, depending on which hand is, like the, the axes travel like this. Okay, it's important to understand because, you know, the axe can only hit each enemy once, but if you hit them at the apex or on the way around, they'll actually hit the enemies oh, twice. Right. Um, one thing to note about wild axes is I generally do recommend that you use quick cast. The reason for this is because, okay, so if you turn quick cast off, you'll, you'll hit the button and you'll actually have to vector target where the axes go which isn't a big deal. But once you consider that Beastmaster is a micro hero and then you might be in a situation where you're microing all these different things, that extra click doesn't make things particularly easy. So with quick cast, you basically just move your mouse in the direction, you hit the Q button and it launches the axes in place, which is great and something I appreciate. Now, with that also being said, I should talk about some of the micromanagement part. Now, this is just general kind of tips and you can customize this as you wish i generally have my heroes selected on one and all units selected on space bar this means that if i want to control everybody i hit my space bar if i just want to control my hero i hit the number one and if i want to control everything but my hero i hit my number two if i hit tab it'll switch between my selected units okay so that's how i do it and then for the call of the wild hawk right, which I do have my Agnum Shard for what i do is i actually set it so that my control group three is my wild hawk so what i do is i select my wild hawk i hit control three and this will uh, kind of remember between games the result of that when i hit the, the number three it'll actually give me my hawk and then i hit q and i can use my agonum shard ability which is the stun dive which is great so that's kind of like a quick example on how you can actually kind of set up your hawk keys to benefit beastmaster but once again if you throw wild axes and you hit someone on the apex they take double damage and they'll take double damage if they get hit by uh, an axe twice with that being said, um, Call of the Wild Boar is an ability that is, uh, is, is truly remarkable because it provides you with a lot of opportunities to harass and slow enemies. Look at the speed difference, okay? The enemy being slowed can barely move, right? The slow difference is very important, and that type of control 
on uh, in, in games can be the difference between living and dying for a lot of heroes, right? And Call of the Wild Boar does exactly that. It provides a lot of damage, but most importantly, a lot of utility in slows. What I recommend you do is in team fights, you should actually apply the boar and kind of sick the boar onto the enemy carries so that it prevents them from moving as effectively in fights and gets your team able to kind of kite them very effectively. The Call of the Wild Hawk provides a lot of vision. It's often beneficial to throw it above trees and stuff like that. It's invisible. However, enemies with like towers and detection can still find it and kill it for experience another important consideration with your boars in the laning stage you don't want to feed them to the enemy because if you do they actually give quite a bit of experience so your enemy is going to quickly out level you which is problematic finally i want to show you the effect of call of sorry of primal war now primal roar is a bkb piercing ability that means even if the enemy is spell immune let me just show you here. Even if they're spell immune, they'll still get stunned. So watch this, okay? So I have my free spells on, so I can just cast it over and over again. So if I cast it here, so I'm going to throw my axes, stun him. You can see he got stunned, which is great. But you might say, okay, Alex, what's this BKB piercing thing all about? Okay? He's invulnerable from spells, but guess what? He's still getting stunned, okay? So that is what makes uh, it such an important skill. It's a very reliable stun. The only thing that counters it is Lincoln's Sphere, uh, which is right here. So Lincoln's Sphere counters it. So basically, if I Primal Roar him, the Lincoln Sphere cancels it. If I Primal Roar him again, while well, Lincoln Sphere is still on... Oh, there's no... It's free spells, of course. But anyways, Lincoln Sphere will counter it. That's the only thing. BKB will not. So BKB, no problem. Lincoln Sphere problem okay that's important to understand as a beast master um, the other thing you need to know is that it'll actually push enemy heroes uh, around so the enemies that get pushed actually take the damage and they take a slow and attack slow so if i throw if i roar this guy okay that's that's a meme i actually kind of forgot he had a lincoln sphere my bad anyways so you do it it pushes these guys out of the way they took the damage they get displaced with force movement and they also get a movement and attack slow so in team fights it has a bit of an aerial effect for the team fighting okay and once again the inner beast does apply to all creep waves so if you have a creep wave for instance well let's send a creep wave here so we'll get these guys out of the way so they don't uh, interfere they kind of interfered but anyways what you're gonna notice here is even though I'm just standing here doing nothing my guys are attacking way faster okay and the result of this is that in my aura field my lane's just gonna push these guys are gonna win the fight and my lane's gonna push even though I'm not even attacking look at this they're munching through the lane minions because of the benefit of the attack speed that I've provided okay so that's something to, uh, that's very important to remember with Beastmaster he really pushes the lane now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about individual creeps that are important to understand when utilizing Helm of the Dominator all right, guys, I'm going to link this down below because I think it's incredibly valuable for you to understand when playing heroes that utilize creeps and minions, uh, such as Doom, Beastmaster, Chen. It's very important you understand how the neutrals work. Now, this, this here is going to provide you access to all the different types of camps, all the different types of creeps, and the different abilities that they utilize. And that's kind of the important thing to understand. I'm going to get through them right now. So basically, you have the Centaur Conqueror. So when you utilize this lane minion, so basically you dominate with your Helm of the Dominator, and then what you do is when you, uh, when you select it, you can utilize its ability, which is War Stomp. This is a unit that can basically provide you with an additional stun, and it stuns heroes for two seconds, which is very considerable. So, that being said, Centaur Conqueror, a very popular one for heroes like Beastmaster and Doom, especially Doom, you can blink on top, you can stun them twice, right? Beastmaster is the same. You blink, you Primal Roar, just before Primal Roar is done, you bring the minion over, and he stuns the enemy hero again for two more seconds of stun. Truly remarkable. The Alpha Wolf is off, uh, often utilized as well because of its passive. So it has an aura that provides attack damage, 30%, 30%. The amazing thing about the pack leader aura is that it legitimately scales wonderfully into the late game because it's percentage based. That makes it a very popular, um, popular uh, aura to be picking up on the, the unit. Hellbear Smasher. Very interesting unit. It's a pretty good one as well. Uh, it has a good thunderclap ability, which provides an attack and move speed slow. And it has swiftness aura, which provides you with attack speed benefits as well. Overall, a very good unit and one that you'd want to grab. Okay, so again, the Hellbear Smasher provides you with a thunderclap and a aura as well, which stacks. 
So Dark Troll Summoner, kind of niche, kind of niche. The reason why you'd use uh, Dark uh, Troll Summoner is for the Ensnare ability. The Ensnare ability basically roots a target for almost two seconds, and it's very useful against units that have a lot of mobility, Queen of Pains, Anti-Mages, and others. So the Dark Troll Summoner is very good at locking down a hero that is very mobile, okay? One could argue that the uh, Centaur is just as good with the stun, but hey, you know, options are options. Then you have the Tormentor. The Tormentor is interesting because he gives you a uh, health regeneration bonus, which makes him interesting in the laning phase. And also his targeted ability Shockwave does do a little bit of damage. It's not a lot of damage, but hey, if someone's trying to run away, you can get him with it, right? Because it kind of travels in a straight line. It has decent range on it. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. And finally, we have the Wild Wing Ripper. Now, this is a very popular one because it provides you with an armor bonus, which is very useful. It's mostly used on someone like Doom during the laning phase, but regardless, Beastmaster can benefit from it as well. And his active is a Tornado being channeled, which is like kind of the least beneficial of the skills, but still kind of interesting at the end of the day and one that is worth utilizing. Finally, we have the Mud Golem, and there's others too, but these are kind of the main ones you'd utilize. Um, actually, there's the Ancient ones I'll talk about shortly as well. But the Mud Golem's interesting because he has Hurl Boulder, which is basically a mini stun of basically uh, half a second, and you can target it like you target target like a uh, just a regular stun, and it's kind of useful. Now, when discussing the Ancient Creeps, we have the Ancient Black Dragon. He's most known for his ability to cast Fireball, which is great at pushing lanes. The Fireball will do an AoE kind of damage area, which will push lanes and create a ton of damage on uh, waves and basically create a lot of lane pressure. It also has a splash attack, and the armor bonus provided by Dragonite Aura is very beneficial as well. When you get to the Ancient Granite Golem, the amazing thing about him is that he's kind of slow and kind of lanky, but 15% health bonus to all allies... That is insane. That is so much health. And if you have a very strength heavy lineup, that is a ton of added HP, which can be super beneficial. Um, so that's something worth considering as well. Granite Golem, pretty damn good too. Finally, you have the Thunderhide, and he's pretty cool too. He has basically a Bloodlust ability where you can cast Frenzy on any of your allies. So if you have like a Sven, you can cast Frenzy on the Sven. And he has Slam, which is a pretty cool ability, similar to the Th the um, the Hellbear Smasher. It provides a attack and movement speed slow, except it's a little long, uh, a little like greater in its effect. So a very good option as well. Generally speaking, if you're confused what to take, you generally want the Dragon, the Golem the uh the centaur or the uh the pack leader for the damage aura late in the game all right in this example here we're looking at some pro beastmaster gameplay and what you're going to see is he's defending his boars and not feeding them this is an example of the laning stage we have a very similar item build and what you're doing here is you're getting as many last hits as possible now what i want to I want to also focus on here is how he utilizes his boars when he sees that a, a hero is vulnerable so again he's getting last hits he's he's harassing when possible but he, you'll see that he notices that the marana right is causing problems for the skywrath so essentially, the Beastmaster sends the boar onto the Marana to slow her down and create some harass potential, right? The boar continues to chase this Marana while Beastmaster remains in lane. This is the utility of Beastmaster in the laning phase. You get situations where you can do multiple things with your army, and that is super beneficial. And right here, you're going to see he has them both selected. He's utilizing them two at a time in order to ensure he gets last hits, particularly on the range creep. So now he's using it to simply secure CS, which is super valuable. Valuable. and again he can convert them into doing hero damage like right there just casually poking away at the hero slowing them down and being a nuisance for this example we're actually looking at my gameplay and what we're doing here is we just got the helm of the, do uh, the dominator we have our primal roar i'm pushing towers and what i notice right away is that a team fight is starting to set up here so what i do is i recognize that i'm very strong right now but at the same time i want to push this tower now in some MMRs, players will not fully recognize the kill threat that, that Beastmaster poses. Like this Morphling, for instance, that does not recognize that I can literally just straight up destroy him. And it, I mean, that was a split, bit of a suspect play, but regardless, it's a very straightforward kill here because of the fact that he did not respect the strength of Beastmaster. Now here we have a Ricky who comes in to try and help his boy out, and he does not recognize how much damage my summons are doing. Great uh, ward placement by the Lich. We get another kill. 
And guess what? It's not even over yet because now we're just pushing. Give them the, you know, the classic little uh, question mark. Now, I want you guys to see this quick. This is actually really interesting here. And I want to show you that what's happening here is they got the kill on the Lich. Okay, they got the kill on the Lich, which is fine. Lich gets killed here. But I want you to identify how much damage my summons do. So I have the boar. I have the Hellbear Smasher. Right? He's right here. This Snapfire is level 5 at full HP. Watch what happens to this Snapfire. I have- I'm- I'm running away, but I- I sicked my minions on top of the Snapfire. Not only that, but he's in the middle of the wave, and what happens to him? He gets killed! He goes down while I'm escaping the fight, which is absolutely fantastic. That is one of the things that Beastmaster can do. Beastmaster can save himself while still applying pressure with his minions. It's absolutely fantastic, and do not forget the strength of your minions. Now, this is the same game moments later. My primal war comes off of cooldown, and I tell my Lich we gotta go on this Morphling. So he starts off a little fast, but regardless of this, I want you to understand just how fast you can kill a carry. So I roar here to close the gap, which I mean, it's not the greatest roar, because at times you'd rather use your roar to like, be on top of the guy. But with my boar, I knew I had to slow this Morphling, who's a huge pain to kill. And ultimately, we honestly just right click him down. We right click him down because he couldn't deal with the minions attacking him, the damage being applied by the uh, the roar, the stun, and his inability to escape thanks to the boar slow. And from there, I get back to the lane, I create a ton of map pressure, and we allow the, uh, the enemy to basically be in a situation where they either have to respond to me, or they're going to lose their tier 2 at 13 minutes in the game. All right, in this example here, we're once again taking a look at when we get to level 6. We're at level 6, we have Helm of the Dominator, we have Primal Roar, and what do we do? We create map pressure with the uh, by pushing the towers. Again, we're always going to be pushing as a Beastmaster. We try to take that tower as quickly as possible. We're looking at basically a 9-minute tower, which is absolutely fantastic. But what do we do from there, right? We get the jungle, and then we immediately look for kills. Okay, we know that we have our roar. We know that we have a controlled minion. There's a Wraith King here. We roar on him. We get on top of him. We position the Hellbear Smasher in front of him so that he cannot escape. Let's actually take a look at that again. I think that's a really interesting lesson. Okay, the micromanagement here. You take the Hellbear Smasher, you move him to the other side so that in the event that the Wraith King goes to run away, you're able to block him. Now, we are fortunate to get a Wind Ranger stun here. We secure the kill on the, the Wraith King, who does not take his uh, rear incarnation at six in this case because he wants to farm faster but ultimately that's what you do and what's interesting about this is that now you just dominate the jungle you take over the jungle you own their side of the map and make it very difficult for their carry to get into the game all right now we're in the mid game and what I want to illustrate to you here is that there's a lot going on and most importantly with beast match it's all about taking over the enemy side of the map okay you want to create as much pressure as possible you want to take away as much farm as they can and you want to put it uh, put the enemy in a situation where they have to respond to you now watch this this is important as well he throws the hawk in division of the trees so that if anybody TPs in, he's going to see it and he's going to be able to respond. So he knows Mars is coming, so that tells him I got to back off. Yeah, Mars gets a free uh, hawk kill, but Beastmaster lives another day and continues to take farm away from the enemy team. In this situation here, he thinks about going mid, but ultimately just owns the jungle. He owns the enemy jungle. He's playing on their side of the map. He's not taking farm away from his troll warlord. And knowing it's a troll warlord and a beast master with the aura, they jump in to Roshan. They take the pit, and what do you think they do? They're gonna continue creating non-stop pressure. He gets back into their jungle and he keeps the pressure up. That's all Beastmaster does. Beastmaster sees that this lane's not pushed in, and he pushes the lane in, right? Obviously, I'm simplifying a little bit here, but Beastmaster is all about playing on their side of the map, creating a ton of map pressure, and forcing the enemy team to respond to you. All right, in this example here, what we've done is we have a Blink Dagger with Primal Roar. That allows us to be a Blink Initiator. And what we do here is we initiate on top of this Wraith King, we do the Roar, we do the Axis to amplify the damage, we get the, uh, the Boar out, and we basically take him down. Now, the Bane has other plans, gives us the Fiend's Grip, but that's okay. It's not a big deal, because eventually we are going to take out this Bane as well, right? Rubik thinks twice about coming in. Bane's down, carries down, and that is a damn good fight for your team, all because you were able to blink initiate on top of an unsuspecting core. In this final example, we're taking a look at another blink initiation, but I really like this one because there's a little more going on. We're waiting for the right initiation opportunity. We know that Lena is our primary target. Her Lincolns gets popped, we roar her, we put the damage in on her, but what happens here? 
She goes invisible. But guess what? We dust her, and what do we do? We send a hawk in to get the stun, and we finish her off with the wild axes. I'm actually gonna go back so you guys can see that again. That was truly remarkable. So we go on the Lena. We have the hawk in range. Lena is in vision. She gets stunned. We throw the wild axes, and that is masterfully done as a beastmaster. And now, right? I'll throw those tips 100%. And now. We push to end the game with Beastmaster, his minions, a Troll Warlord, and the inner, uh, sorry, the uh, inner beast aura. Thank you guys so much for watching, and a very special thank you to all of our wonderful subscribers. I hope this guide helped you, and we'll see you in the next Dota 2 video.